continuing our study on supernatural. And we, how many know that we serve a supernatural God? When you look through Scripture, we see He is supernatural, right? He is supernatural. I mean, He is He is above all. He is He created the universe, and and we see the we see the miracles that Jesus performed. None of those things were natural, were they? Not one of those things were natural. And so we, we need to understand that we serve an awesome God. We serve a God that stands outside of nature. It stands outside of everything that we understand. Our finite minds cannot understand the God that we serve. Right? We, so we, we certainly don't understand the God that we serve. I'm trying to trouble my computer, praise the Lord. My wife's computer. Okay. Where's the bull down? Where's the ball? Okay. All right, well, we're, we're working. We're, we're working. So. Praise the Lord. We're having one of those days today. Um, but we serve, man, so go ahead and pull the first slide up, Kyle. Let me get the focus off of me. All right. So when we, when we look at this and we understand close encounters, right? I say close encounters, what comes to your mind? Something like this? Right? Close encounter of the third kind, close encounter of the... Or, or, or there's actually another one that's called the fourth kind. Does anybody understand what this is meaning? Okay, we'll, we'll talk about that here in just a second. Can you hit, hit the next slide? Maybe you recognize this little fella. <laughs> Who is that little fella? Yoda, right? I, I'm going to put Spock up there. Yoda, everyone, everyone knows who Yoda is, right? So, if you want to pull the next one up. So, this is what we see. Does it, 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 so, this is what we think of when we think of close encounters, right? I heard Ray say in the back, we think of aliens most of the time, right? Yeah. Close encounter, and when you can see the picture here, and really recently, it's aliens, the close encounters and stuff that's been uh, that, that that's been in the news. Anybody remember last year? I believe it was they were looking to rush Area 51. Yeah. Was it last year or year before? Somebody got somebody got the mindset they were going to rush Area 51, uh, not understanding that they, if they do that, you'll die. You will literally die. They will shoot you without questions. I mean, uh, there, there are pictures out there of the, the, of the signs like 20 miles out from where Area 51 is. And they just keep acquiring property so they can keep people from, from getting so close. What do they have to hide? Anyway, we won't go there. <laughs> we won't go there. But when, but when you think about close encounters, and you, and you understand what it is, I actually looked it up. There are five different encounters. When you talk about aliens, the first the first encounter is the first kind. The, you know that's why that one is called the fourth kind. The first kind of encounter is a human witness of a UFO. Anybody ever seen a UFO? I I I'm, I'm, I, I don't know if anybody watches that. I watch this on the on the History Channel, the uh, the the secret of Skinwalker Ranch. It's crazy. I don't know what's going on out there, but it's some crazy stuff. But but there are reports. How many know, how many have ever? Do, does anybody know of anybody that knows that, that has seen a UFO or a UAP as they call them now? Yeah, you're evil. <laughs> well, that's that's the first kind. The second kind of encounter is an encounter of a, the, the, a UFO encounter leaves behind physical evidence on the ground or traces somewhere within a field or you know what have you like that. Anybody ever ever heard of the crop dust, the crop circles? <laughs> And study, you know, so whether they're a hoax or whether they're real, I don't know. And they, I mean, they're finding things, that hieroglyphs and, and stuff that, I don't know, it's crazy. I, I don't know what's going on, like I said, but that's the second kind. The third kind of encounter is a human can visibly see the beings or the occupants of the UFO. They visibly see aliens. Visibly see it, okay? So that's close encounters of the third kind, right? Anybody, did anybody ever see that movie? Sister Betty has. So, that's my movie buff back there. Uh, the movie, movie buff. So we, the, the, the close encounter, that, that's where they, they, they see the UFO and, 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 and they see the beings of the UFO, but there's another kind. The fourth kind of encounter 
is in, in the, this encounter includes a human being abducted by an alien and taking aboard a UFO for experimentation, probing, or whatever else you want to think of. That's what that, that's what the fourth kind and and that movie the fourth kind. Anybody seen the fourth kind? Man, that, that that messes with you. That's 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 messed up. That was actually that was an, an actual supposedly an actual account that took place. It's based on an actual account that took place. But there's one more kind of 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 encounter with a bee, and the fifth kind of encounter with an alien is a close encounter with a bee that that, that includes. This is where the, the fourth kind is just being abducted. I'm sorry, I got it wrong. The fourth kind is just being abducted. The fifth kind is being experimented on. Probing, you know, you, you, you hear it. I mean, just recently. Uh, did anybody watch Independence Day? Yeah, I mean, they play it every year, right? You, you, you know, you, the White House blown up. Anybody remember what I'm talking about? The White House being blown up. They made, they made a big deal. Clinton was in office. Made a big deal about the White House being blown up. Remember? So the, the fifth time is when the experimentation happened. And that's when probing happens. That's when uh, you're taken on board. And, and I mean, I, I won't go into everything they say here. But uh, they, they, they do some weird stuff from what I can understand. That's what they say happens. And so when we look at this, though, I mean, whether they're real or not, uh, we're not going to get into that debate. Uh, you know, my, my thinking is, let me just clear the air. My thinking is, if God created them, who am I to say that's, that they're, I mean, you know, God could have done it. I mean, he's God, right? I mean, we'd serve a supernatural God, right? He could have created all kinds of things, right? That we just don't know about. We know about what's here. What we see around us. So God could have created more than what we see, but we're just not sure. So I'm not going to I'm not gonna speculate too much. If he did, he's God. He can do whatever he wants to, right? I'm going to agree with that. If he's God, he, he, he can do whatever he wants to. He's God. He stands outside of time. That's what makes our God... Supernatural. Right. Go ahead and click off that code. But you see, supernatural, that's where that we, we, we need to look in Scripture and see exactly how He is supernatural. And the thing is, He wants to have a close encounter with us. He wants that close encounter with us. So, turn in your Bibles. I do have it on screen. But turn in your Bibles under the NLT today to Exodus chapter 33. And we're going to look at an encounter that, again, last week we talked about how the children of Israel decided they didn't want to have anything to do with God. They didn't want God speaking to them, remember? They didn't want God speaking to them because they were scared. They feared Him. But Moses didn't. What's the, what, what, what's the difference between Moses... And the children of Israel. Well, we're going to look at that a little bit today. We're going to look at, at this close encounter that Moses had because Moses had this close encounter. Moses had this close encounter. So with, uh, with, with that being said, you'll see it up here again. I'm in the NLT. You can find it in your Bible. It says, whenever Moses went out to the tent of meeting, all the people would get up and stand at the entrance the entrances of their own tents. They would all watch Moses until he disappeared inside. As he went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and hover at its entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Next slide. Inside the tent of meeting, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Afterward, Moses would return to the camp, but the young man who assisted him, Joshua, son of Nun, would remain behind in the tent of meeting. That's crazy. Joshua would stay behind. I mean, we could, we could sit here and talk about that for a while, right? Joshua would stay behind. There's something about the presence of God. There's something about the supernatural presence of God, but we're not focusing on, on Joshua. But it is, it is interesting to note that Joshua was the next leader of the children of Israel. He's the one that took them into the promised land and helped them conquer, led them in conquering the promised land. Would he have done that had he not been with Jesus? Would he have done that if he not spent time with the Lord? Hmm, I don't know. I don't know. You can go ahead and click on that. See, when we look at this, Moses 
would meet with the Lord in the tabernacle. The tent of meeting is what's, what it's called. The tent of meeting, the tabernacle. Moses would meet with God there face to face. Does that not strike anybody odd? Has anybody heard of the scripture? And we're actually going to talk about this. Does God not say within Exodus, just a little while later, no one can see me face to face and live? But here we're told God would meet with Moses face to face. He wanted to do that with the entire nation of Israel. And so we see this at close encounter. I mean, he, he got so close to God, if we were talking about it, he could see God's eye color, right? I was looking at it, I was looking at it yesterday, I was looking at Thorin last night. And, and you know, I'm, I'm, Anyway, we're, we're not going to go into all that. But I looked at it and I thought, I wonder, because, you know, the close-up on Thor's eyes, right? What color is, are his eyes? Anybody know? Anybody pay attention? Or you, or you went into it to enthrall with how beautiful he is. There's beautiful blue like the sea after a storm. Blue. Now, now there's a lot of talk on You get to see a whole lot more of Thor in the new movie. So I caution people on going to see it. There's a whole lot more of Thor that you see in the movie. I'm just saying. I'm not recommending anybody go see it. I'm, anyway. But his eyes. I, and I actually wondered. I almost asked Nikki. I'm like. Are his eyes really that blue? Because, you know, they, they can do stuff with contacts. And are his eyes really that blue? Well, I want to be so close to God like Moses to where I want to know what his eye color is if he has eyes. Right? I, that's how close I want to be. Moses was that close. He, he met with God face to face like a friend. This is well before, well before Jesus ever came. Right? But he met with Moses as a friend, meaning that even in the Old Testament, God wanted to interact with people. He wanted to have that close relationship with his people. But they pulled away. They backed away because being in his presence means something has to change, right? There has to be a change within His presence, and that's the challenge we face today. So many of the churches today don't really want to, so many of people that fill the churches today don't want to get very close to God. Because when you get into His presence, something has to change, right? There has to be a change to take place. Because you can't go in and see Him and live. There has to be a change. Something has to change. And see, the thing is, another, another, another thing that I've watched and seen among today's Christians, among today's churches, is that we're too concerned with what everybody thinks. Who should, whose opinion should we care about? Yours? Mine? Or his? I mean, think about it. You know, the, the Word tells us that, that if God is for us, who can be against us? So, He created everything that we see. Why would I be concerned about what humans can do to me or what they think of me? David said, what can mere mortals do to me? They can destroy the shell of a body, right? But can they destroy the soul? So why, should, why are we so concerned with what with what people think. Now don't get me wrong, okay, we, we need to live and have a good reputation in this world, right? But when it comes to the things of God, when it comes to standing in truth, standing on the promises of the Word of God, in a wicked world where they're looking for truth, they've got to know the truth, we should be concerned about what He has to say and not what anybody else says. Right? Because this world, trust me, this world is coming for us. They are looking to destroy the truth that we hold in our hands. Every time we turn the TV on, it seems like they're just chipping away at the truth. Every time we walk into our workplaces, our schools, every time we walk into, just any time we go anywhere in this world, they're chipping away at the truth that we know and we stand on. We've got to tell them the truth, no matter what they think about us. 
But we need to, we, we have to have this desire to come inside of us to get so close to God that we don't even care what our fellow church people think. Moses didn't care. Moses didn't care what anybody thought. He wanted to be close to God, and we'll get into that here in a little while. But we see what happens here. We see, we see that, 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 that as, they, as Moses entered the, temp, the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, as he was making his way there, what did the people do? They stood at the tent and then they bowed down and worshipped. Well, what were they worshipping? God invited them in. He invited them into his presence. What were they, why were they bowing down? Well, they, it was almost like, it, it, to me, it's, it's a picture of them almost worshipping Moses. Kind of what the Catholics do today, right? Let the priests go in for us. Well, you, you know that the, the Catholic, everything the Catholics do is based on Old Testament, the tabernacle, the temple of the Old Testament, right? They've got this misconstrued idea that we have to have the priest go in for us, right? We have to have somebody else go in for us. We have to go to a priest and confess our sins to a priest. That's not what the Word says. God wants us to have that close encounter with us, but something has to die when we come into His presence. Something has to die when we get that close to Him. Something has to die. This old selfish man, our carnal nature, our sinful mind, it all has to die when we get into His presence. And, and I'll show you exactly what that means here in a little while. Can I pull up the next scripture? Exodus chapter 33, verses 9 to 11. This is... Is it 9 to 11? Is that, is that the right one? Okay, I've got it written down wrong here then. Okay, all right, so yeah, no, this is right. It says, one day Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me... Okay, so wait, let, let me pause here for just a second. You understand, between Exodus 20 and Exodus 33, that's one encounter with God. Moses is having one encounter with God. What is God giving him? In Exodus chapter 20, what did God give him? The Ten Commandments. Okay, and then everything, and that's where, again, I told you last week, the people heard the requirements that God was making of them. The Ten Commandments. And they backed away. It was in verse 18, they backed away of chapter 20, right? They backed away and said, no, no, no. 18 to 21, they said, no, no, no. We don't want, no, we, we see that, we, we don't want to hear it. We don't want to hear it. Right? <clears throat> and so everything after that, up until Exodus chapter 33, is God giving him command, the commands of how they are to treat others, how they are. He is expounding on the Ten Commandments. He is going in depth with what the Ten Commandments mean. The Ten Commandments are the basic, you know, that's the one-liners, right? Don't commit adultery, don't sin, don't, don't worship any other gods, and so on and so forth, right? The one-liners, honor your father and mother and children. <laughs> They're not even paying attention. Honor your father and mother, right? That, that, well, that goes for the adults that have good parents still alive today. We're to honor our father anyway. But he's giving the one-liners, right? But then he expounds on worship. He expounds on how we're to treat others. He expounds to Moses exactly what that means, what the Ten Commandments mean. He gives the he gives the precedent for the tabernacle. He gives the, he gives them instructions on what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to handle his presence, because that's what the tabernacle represented, right? So all throughout all throughout those chapters of Exodus twenty, after after they had that encounter, just him just telling Moses and instructing Moses exactly what to do up until up until Exodus thirty three. And that's where we come in here, okay? So now with that, Moses, one day Moses said to the Lord, going back to Exodus chapter thirty three, verses twelve through fourteen, it says, You have been you have been telling me Take these people up to the promised land, but you haven't told me whom you will send with me. You have told me I know you by name, and I look favorably on you. If it is true that you look favorably on me, let me know your ways so I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. 
And remember that this nation is your very own people. The Lord replied, I will go personally with you, Moses. And I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. Now there's a lot there. Right? So first of all, we see Moses saying, you've been telling me, you've been promising me. How many have ever gone into God's presence and, and you remind him of his promises? It's not that he's forgetful. He wants us to he wants us to do that for us, not for him. He's not forgetful, right? He wants us to remind him of his promises for us. And so that's what Moses is doing here. He said, you've been promising me that I'm going to take these people into the promised land. You've been telling me that I am highly favored of you. You've been telling me you know me by name. How powerful is that? He knew Moses. He told Moses, I know your name. That's being close to God, right? That's being close to God. That's having an encounter, a close encounter with God. He is not reminding God because God has not been faithful. How many know God is faithful? God is faithful no matter what. He is faithful when we're not faithful. He is faithful when we fail Him. He is still faithful. And so... Moses is just, is, just, is just reminding him for his own benefit. You're saying these things about me. You're saying I, you know my name. You're saying I feel you find favor in me. You're saying you know you, you, all of these things. But if that's true, notice what he said right here. If that's true, that you look favorably on me, what does he say after that? Give me more blessings. Is that what he says? Give me another Bentley. Give me a Bugatti. Give me the biggest house on Lake James. Right? Is that what he says? Notice what he says here. Let me know your ways so that I may understand you more fully. In other words, Moses... Knew God face to face. Met with God every day face to face. But it still wasn't enough. Let me know your ways so that I may know you more fully. Doesn't matter how much of God you think you have. You don't have enough. You don't know nearly enough about Him. Every day, the Word tells us every day, His grace and His grace and mercy is all new, right? We can't outgrace Him. We can't outrun His grace. There is no way that our little finite minds can ever know enough about God, ever. The only way that's going to happen is when we are with Him in eternity. Let me know Your way, so that I so that I may understand You more fully. How do we enjoy His favor? How do we continue to enjoy His favor? Get closer to Him because look at what Moses said. Continue, let me know you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. If you want to know more, if you want more favor, you've got to know more of God. Do you see how that works? You have to know more of God. His mercy is new every day. We've got to take advantage of that mercy every day that we live. Our salvation, it's great. It's wonderful. How many are thankful for salvation? But it doesn't stop there, does it? We should be growing in Him, looking to learn His way more so that we may more fully understand Him. Right? And the Lord, look, look at what the Lord said. Look what the Lord, how the Lord replied. It's really weird, right? It says, I will go personally go with you, Moses. Let that sink in for a second. I will personally go with you, Moses. And I will give you rest, Moses. What about the people of God? God was frustrated. God was frustrated beyond belief with His people. He invited them up. 
He invited them into His presence. He invited them into His glory. And they said, no, that's going to cost us too much. You go for us, Moses. You go for, you go for us. That's it. We're, uh, we don't want any more. We can't. And, and, and see, notice that Moses, I mean, how, how awesome would that be? I mean, if, if, if that were us today, we'd stop right there and say, I don't care about anybody else. Give me all. Give it all to me, right? Give me what, give it to me. I'm, you know, I'm ready to go. Let's go. I'll forsake. I mean, you know, Jesus did say, if we're not willing to forsake our family, then we're not worthy to follow him, right? We twist that around, don't we? We have a tendency to twist that around to where we, we, we want all of God's blessings. And that's what we would do right here because that, that doctrine's out there. Right? Give me all, give it all to me, Lord. It doesn't matter what it's going to cost me. I don't, I, I don't want to hear about what it costs. Just give me all your blessings, right? Give me all your blessings, Lord. I don't care. I, you know, I, I don't even really want to see your face. Just give me your gifts. Give me your presence, right? That's what we think today. But Moses, I want you, I want you, I want you to look closely at this. Go home and read this closely. In order for us to have more favor, we've got to know Him more. We've got to know His ways more. We've got to know Him personally. You can't come into a Sunday service and expect to get everything you need and go home and feed on that because you're going to be really hungry by next Sunday. You don't, and trust me, why don't you try it this week? We, we could all use the, you know, back away from the table, right? Just try not to eat. Just just go just go without eating until Sunday and see how hungry you are. Um, you yeah, know, anyway. You see, but this, this is what we're saying, though. I mean, you've got to know Him more. You have to know Him personally. He is inviting you in. Take advantage of that. Look at your neighbor and say, I want a close encounter. I want a close encounter. Go to the next scripture, Kyler. In Exodus chapter 33, verses 15 to 18. Now, now, this, now, now we're, we're going to look at this. And, and man, this is some powerful stuff that Moses said. Then Moses said, if you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. Wait a minute. Notice what Moses did here. He turned it around. The, in, in, the, in verse 14, the Lord said, I'm going to go with you personally, Moses. And Moses turns this around and says... Don't, let, don't make us leave this place. If you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave. How will you know? How will anyone know that you are you look favorably on me and on me and your people if you don't go with us? For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all other people on the earth. The Lord replied to Moses. I will indeed do what you have asked, for I look favorably on you, and I know you by name. Moses responded, then show me your glorious presence. Is there another scripture over that, Kyler? Okay. So, come up here. Pull, pull that back up. So, I want you to look at this. The Lord said, I'm going to go with you, Moses, right? I'm going to go with you. That wasn't good enough for Moses. Moses then proceeds to remind God of his promise to his people. God promised his people through, and through Abraham that he would bless them, right? He gave that promise to Abraham. And so Moses then says, wait a minute, wait, I, I, I'm, I'm misunderstanding you. You promised that your people, you would keep your hand on them. You promised that you would help them. You promised that they would be set apart, that people, that and the whole world would know the Israelites are your people, right? That's what that, that God, that this is what Moses is saying. I'm, I'm, I'm confused, God. Anybody ever gone in God's presence and said that? I'm confused. I do it all the time. I mean, listen. God, God is a God of mercy and grace, especially with me. He, I'm telling you, I, I go into His presence and I'm like, what the heck? Maybe you don't talk to Him like that, but I do because He talks to me just like that. He slaps me upside my head and says, you, you, man, what's wrong with you? Right? 
See, this is how God, and, and so I go into his presence all the time, and I'm like, Moses, I'm like, uh, excuse me, I, I'm confused. I, I, don't, I don't know what's going on right now. Can you help me? See, Moses is saying, your promise has been on your people. And if you don't go with us, that's going to look bad on you. That's what he says, right? In today's language, that's what he says. If you don't go with us, this is going to de- this is going to defame your own name. And so Moses says, "How will anyone know that you look favorably on me and on your people if you don't go with us?" Now, what he says next is so powerful. For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all the other people on the earth. We are a special people. We're told that we're a peculiar people, right? See, what what happens here is Moses is actually challenging God. This is the same Moses that saw the plagues, right? He saw the plagues. He saw, he saw the burning bush. Anybody remember the burning bush that Moses saw? The bush that wasn't burning up? He saw the burning bush, all the plagues. He saw the Red Sea part. He saw the destruction of Pharaoh and his army. He saw the pillar of cloud by day and the fire by night. He saw all of that. Not only did he see that, he was a participant in that. So he is going back and saying, wait a minute. You saved us, God. You brought us out, God. You did all of these things to show these people that you saved are your own. And they're peculiar, and you set them apart. Now, if you don't go with us, you're going back on what you did. You're going back on your promise. Now, I mean, I'm reading into the text. Just read it. If you don't agree with us, let me know later. But, I mean, you know, he's saying... Your presence sets us apart. We are a chosen people, is what Moses is saying. Moses is saying, and he's reminding the Lord of his words. And and he's challenging God. Wait a minute. If you don't go with us, what's the point of going? Right? If you don't, if you're not, if I'm not right behind your footsteps and and I'm not following you, I'm going out there on my own. There's a difference in going with God and us following God. There's a difference. With implies he's right there by your side. When you're following him, you mean that means you're following the footsteps. Anybody ever tried to follow somebody's footsteps on the on the beach? It's pretty hard, right? Because as as the waves crash in. And you're trying to follow in those footsteps. If you're not quick enough, what happens when the waves come? Washes those footprints away and you you can't put your foot with. So you've got to be right there. You've got to be right there following right behind him. Following his lead. That is what Moses is saying. If you're not with us, we're not following you, then we're not going anywhere. We're staying right here unless you go with us. And And then the Lord replies to him, I will indeed... Do what you have asked, for I look favorably on you. See, now God's turning it back around. <laughs> okay, so Moses is turning it to, what about the people? You look favorably on me, that's great. But what about your people? And God then turns it around and says, I will do exactly what you want because I look favorably on you, and I know you by name, not the people. So, when we are talking about this, you know, we have a responsibility as a people of God, don't we? We have a responsibility. We should be crying out to people. If we want to see people supernaturally saved, because the best supernatural thing you can see on this planet is a soul being saved from their sins, right? 
And if, if, if we want to see all of that, that means we need to be like Moses and go in before God and say, but what about them? I'm glad about the blessings for me. I'm thankful for what you've done for me. But what about them? Don't leave them behind. I can't go without them. If they're not going, I'm not going. And if, they, if, they, if, they, if they, you can do whatever you want to. And I mean, Paul got to the point to where if only I could give my own life just so they can be saved. He did not just give his life, but be condemned to hell for his people. Do we have that kind of passion? The kind of passion that Moses had. That's what happens in God's presence. That's what happens when, when we come into His presence. We begin to forget about ourselves and we begin to think about other people. Well, what about what about Bob? What about Billy? What about, what about Susan? What about this person? What about that person? We begin to think about other people and cry out to them. That is our responsibility. Show me your ways that I may know you more. Are you moved by what moves the heart of God? Stand in that gap, as Ezekiel says. We've been, we've all been called to stand in that gap because we serve this supernatural God. Understand that when Moses was in God's presence and he was talking to God like that, God could have struck him down just like that. He could have struck him down, taken the taken the beat away from his heart. He could have struck him down in an instant. But God, but God showed grace and mercy. Why? Because His presence is supposed to make us different. We are not supposed to look like this world. Paul tells us in Romans, be not, tra be not conformed to this world and their behaviors, but be transformed. We're not supposed to look like them. We're not supposed to think like them. Maybe that's what's wrong with the church today is that we don't see miracles happening because we're too busy trying to be like the world to entice them to come in and sit in our, sit in our services and fill our coffers up. Maybe that's what's wrong with the church today. I, I don't want that. I want people that need Jesus. I want people that are hungry for God. I want people that want to that want to do whatever they have to to see people saved. That's what I want. It doesn't matter how much money we bring in, right? The presence of God is supposed to set us apart. I mean, in Connie, pull up for uh, First Peter, First Peter chapter two, verses nine and ten. Look at what it says. This is Peter. He says, but you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. Uh, you are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he calls you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Once you have no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you receive no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. We are supposed to be different. The problem is, we're too busy trying to look like them to win them over. When holiness is what draws people in. When, he, when they see that we're different, when they see that we're set apart, when, we, when they see that our, our attitude, our countenance is totally different than theirs, when hard times come, trials come, tribulations come, they look at us and they should see Jesus in us. <coughs> said, I, I, read a, I read a statistic that said 99% of men won't read the Bible. Wait, no, wait. 2% of men won't read the Bible. 98% of the men will look at you, see Christ in you, read you as their Bible. What kind of, what kind of Bible are they reading when they look at you? See, there is only the, the, the only way we can be like this, the only way we can be what Jesus wants us to be is through his supernatural power. His supernatural power. If we want to see the supernatural in our presence again, maybe we should. Perhaps, I don't know, try to be like him. 
instead of being like others. Maybe we should go hard after God as a deer pants for the water. Maybe we should try to get closer to Him so we can show God's supernatural power to the people that are lost and looking for that kind of thing. If you don't think they're searching for something, then you would not see people reading the horoscopes. You would not see people playing around with a Ouija board. You would not see people calling up the psychics trying to find out what their future is. If you don't think they're searching, you wouldn't find the Muslim nation growing like it is. You wouldn't find this. If they're not searching for something, we should be making them want to search for Jesus. The church in other countries is growing by leaps and bounds. They are growing by leaps and bounds while in America, the Western world, we're watching churches, a thousand churches close every year. At least. I believe it's up to 1,500 now. Church is closing. They're closing at a greater rate than they're opening. Do you see where this is going? I read a statistic recently that said 20% of, of Americans now believe God's word is, is, is God's word. 20%. Back in the 50s, what would you say it was? A lot higher, right? You see what's going on? We need to take this supernatural God that we that, that we have. We need to take this soup. We need to get so close to him that we can tell what his eye, we can hear his heartbeat. Know his eye code. We should be striving after a close encounter like Moses had. To see him face to face. See, when we look at this, pull up uh, Exodus chapter 33 again. Uh, the next scripture. Nice. But it not three. Exodus thirty three, nineteen and twenty three. This is what this is what the word tells us. The Lord replied, I will make my goodness pass before it. Because remember, Moses said, Show me your glory. Show me your glory. And the Lord replied, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will call out my name, not anybody else's name. He'll call out his own name. He knew Moses by name, but he was calling out his own name as he passed aside. And that name was Yahweh. And I will call out my name Yahweh before you. For I will show mercy to anyone I choose. And I will show compassion to anyone I choose. But you may not look directly at my face. For no one may see me and live. The Lord continued, look, stand near, stand near me on this rock. For as my glorious presence passes by, I will hide you in the crevice of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and let you see the, let you see me from behind, but my face will not be seen. Even then, it wasn't enough. Moses wanted more. Moses... Moses' sincere desire was to get as close to God as he wanted to, as he could. Moses, at this point in time, was a dead man walking. He was a dead man. He didn't care if he had to die. He wanted to see God's glory. And God said, you, have shit, you, you can't handle it. Your flesh cannot handle seeing me and living. It will not live. He said, your flesh... I will die if you see my face. So I'm just going to show you a little bit of what goes me a little bit of what passes by you. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. See, Moses, when you think about it, think, think, think about a time when you almost caught God. Because we should all be God chasers, right? I, in case you haven't figured out, I'm I just finished up reading God chasers again. And then, man, I'm telling you, I want to be hard after Him. I want to be hard. I want to be hard after the Lord. Anybody read the God Chaser by Tommy Tenney? I just finished that again. That will that will wreck your mind. That will wreck. But you think you've got enough of God? I'm telling you right now, you don't. 
This is, the, this is the same encounter. And I don't want this encounter. I want something different. I don't, this is the same encounter when God showed up in a place and split the plexiglass, the, split, the plexiglass pulpit in two and threw the pastor back against the wall. Picked him up a little and threw him. See, that plexiglass, that may not mean anything to you, but that plexiglass was designed to, to, to withstand 10,000 pounds of pressure per square inch. God showed, I want something different. I don't know about you, but I want, I want to see God. I want to know Him. And see, and, and, and Moses, he was close enough to taste Him. He was close enough to experience Him. He was close enough to feel His presence. Think about when you almost caught Him yourself. What were your feelings? How did you feel? What did you do? What what exactly took place when you almost caught him? And do you want to go back to that place? Are you there now? Or do you need to go back? See, the, the words of Moses, the words that Moses felt or heard, You can't see my face and live. That should resonate with us. Because we are told to crucify our flesh every day. Paul said, I die daily so that I can be close to him. Paul was caught up into the third heaven. Paul was, why? How did that even happen? Because Paul said, I die daily. See, there's there's something about this. Moses said, I want to see your glory, right? God said, you can't see my face and live. And so Moses died without seeing God's face. It took 1,500 years before that came to realization for Moses. Pull up Matthew chapter 17, Kylie. Matthew 17. Six days later, Jesus took Peter and the two brothers, James and John, and led them up on a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed so that his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. And suddenly, who was there? Moses. Moses and Elijah, who, and, and that's crazy because Elijah never died. But yet he got to see the glory of Jesus. Moses, 1,500 years after his experience where God hit him in the cleft of a rock, is standing there with Jesus because of his prayer. I have to have more of you. I have to have more of you. I want to see your face. What I've got now is not good enough. I've got to see your face. You talk about a supernatural close encounter of the uh, of the all kind time. Right? That's what happened with Moses on the mount of what we call a transfiguration now. So how close do you want to get? How close do you want to get to him today? Again, in, 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 in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, I die daily. Do you say that? Do you die daily? See, this is the part, this is the part where we don't want to hear it. As, 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 in churches, we don't want to hear uh, what, what, what the cost is of seeing God's presence. We don't want to hear what, it, what it's really going to cost us. We don't want to pay what it's really going to cost us. Because it will cost us everything. If you want to see him, it's going to cost you everything. You can't see his face in this flesh and live. You can't. If you really want a close encounter, you have to die. You have to die. This is so serious that Jesus said, I'm going to go down there and I'm going to pay the ultimate price. I'm going to give myself so that they may live and have a chance at eternal life. The choice is now ours. 
You know, I told you about the living sacrifice last week, I think it was. I told you about the living sacrifice and the problems there that, that arise with the living sacrifice, right? You put a living animal on an altar and start to light a fire, what are they going to do? They're going to try to get off there. You know, I'm not, I'm not talking about putting a frog in a, in a pot of water and, and slowly, caught, you know, and killing it. No, 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 I'm not I'm talking. You lay, a, you, you lay, a, you you go and you lay a cow down. You, you you lay a sheep down on an altar and you bring out that knife. And what are they going to do? They going to try to get off that altar. That's the problem with us. We need to be living sacrifices, as Paul tells us. The problem is when the fires get too hot and that blade comes out to begin to cut things off of us, we want to get off the altar, don't we? Mm -hmm. What? You mean I can't do this and still be... Again, you know, I told you, it, it's, it, it, there, there's terminology out there that really confuses me. And I don't understand. There's movements out there that are trying to, that are trying to make it okay to live in sin... According to what the Word says. They're trying to justify it with the Word of God. They're twisting the Scripture around to try to make it to where it's okay to live in sin and still think you're going to heaven. Still think you're right with God. It's out there. And it confuses me. The terminology just baffles me. That's not what my Bible says. Where are you getting this from? This is what I want to look at them and say. What are you talking about? This is why we've got to know this word. That's right. And we've got to grow closer to him. We have to be like Moses and say, teach me your ways so that I may know you more fully. Teach me. So often we don't, we, we want to get, and I, and I just recently heard this. Me and God have an understanding. It's not on TV, I'm not kidding you. Somebody said, me and God have an understanding. What's the, I mean, they were justifying, they were, they were justifying, you know, them living like they were, because they have a quote-unquote understanding. I've heard it from people personally. Well, you know, I told God this. I, I, I told God this, and so it's going to be okay. Really? Is that how it works? I, I, I look at this word and I think, that's not how it works. He has laid it out very clearly in here what we're supposed to do, right? How we're supposed to live. If we want a close encounter with Him, what does it say? We are to draw near to Him, draw close to Him. And He'll come, and, and, and what's the rest of it say? Draw close to Him and He will draw close to us. We've got to make a decision. If we want a close encounter with Him, then we've got to do something for us. We've got to lay everything down. We've got to lay stuff down. Lay, you know, trust me, our hearts, your heart, my heart, sinful and evil. I'm going to tell you right now. Sinful and evil. The only thing that can change us is Jesus Christ. Amen. The only thing that, that, that can change the people in this world is Jesus Christ. Amen. We were talking about this, and we have been, she, she she had a she had a party here, an oil party. How many were here at the oil party? My sister Betty was, and Tracy was, and uh, she had an oil party. And she said, "I couldn't believe it. There were so many people that had had their own medicines for anxiety, depression, and so on." That she said, "I couldn't believe it." Jesus is the hope for all that, right? Living according to this word is what. We need to be doing. To have a close encounter with a supernatural God, we have to draw close to Him. We do that by learning His ways, and we do that by reading His Word and applying it then to our lives, right? Mm -hmm. So do you really want a close encounter with Him? Do you really want a close encounter with Him? One like Moses had. One like Peter had. One like Paul had. Do you really want that kind of encounter with Him? Every disciple of Jesus Christ should be saying wholeheartedly, yes I do. No matter the cost, right? 
could mean laying some things down. It could mean getting off social media for a while. It could mean <coughs> actually giving more money than what we give right now. See what I'm saying? The, this close encounter, I would say, Kylie, play me something, but we don't have the capabilities right now. Play me something, okay, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> See, we, in order for us to understand what a close encounter is, we've got to lay everything down before Him. Everything, everything in this world is going to pass away. If we're holding on to anything in this world, whether it's a relationship, whether it's money, whether it's possessions, whether it's, whether it's, it's, a, it's a false hope, whatever it is, it's going to pass away. It's going to pass away. And when we come to the end of this thing, what is going to matter to you? What are you going to stand there and hold before him? Are you going to stand there and hold all your money that you hoarded up? Are you going to stand there and hold all the possessions that you had? Or are you going to stand there and say, but my family? What exactly is it that you're going to be standing there holding? Are you going to, because the only thing that we can honestly do is get there and say, all I have is Jesus. All I have is Jesus. Right? That's all. So we have to put things away that are in this world to be close to Him. <coughs> and I know the, the, this, this is not popular preaching. I, don't, I didn't expect to get a lot of amens. I didn't. Because this is hard. Living like Jesus is hard. Getting close to God is going to cost us something. And we have to be willing to lay that down. He's not going to force it. If you, What was the first step? He said, if you want to get close to Him, what was the first step? We, did, we just said it. Draw close to Him. And He will draw close to us. So who has to make the first step? We have to make that first step. We have to lay everything down on the cross of Jesus. We have to lay everything down and crucify ourselves. Oh, that's hard. But, but I like doing this. But I like going there. But I like smoking this. But I like drinking that. But if Jesus tells us we need to lay it down... What are we supposed to do? Lay it down. You want to get close to Him, you got to lay it down, right? Mm -hmm. so, Father, I thank You for this day. Father, I pray that I am in a room full of people that want a close encounter with You. I pray that I, I pray that through the, some of the things that I've said and, and, and the crazy way we went about it, that Lord, that it makes them want to draw closer to this supernatural God. But the cost is, is great. According to what this world says, this cost is great. And so, Lord, we're in a different place and, and we've had to get used to this new, this, this new method of, uh, of what we've got going on today. And, and, Lord, I just ask and pray that we push all that to the side and we hear your voice right now. You are calling your people up. You are calling us closer to you. And so I ask and pray that, that your people that are sitting here would hear your voice right now. And so with everyone, all heads bowed, every eye closed, you know the routine. Is there someone in here that through what we've said today needs to have a relationship with Jesus, you realize you're not there. You, you're not in a relationship with Him. Is there anybody in here that would that would just quietly and, and, and just slip your hand up in the air and put it right back down? Facebook, just let us know. Let us know just to, just to, just by letting us just by commenting. Just let us know in the comments that, that that that's you. If that's you, somebody will get with you momentarily, very quickly. 
But is there anybody in here that, that, that would say, I need Jesus. I admit that I don't have a relationship with Him and I need Him. Alright. So we're all family in the house, okay? Now, the next question is, how many of you in the house and online want to go closer? Thank you. Mm-hmm. Just put your hand up in the air. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. That's what we, we, we realize that we need to go closer. Yes. How many realize the cost now? Mm-hmm. That's, I mean, this is individually for you. Thank you. This is individually for y'all. I mean, you, you don't, you, you're not confessing anything to me, but you realize there's a cost in order for you to come closer. And for each person, it's going to be different. That's why it says that we're to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. I can't require things that God requires of me to you, just like you can't do to me. And so this is a very personal thing right now. All of you that raised your hand, that's fantastic. But now, those that raise their hand, do you realize the cost? So let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I delivered what it was that you wanted me to deliver. I I, I gave to the people what it is that you you wanted me to give to them. And Father, right now, I just ask and pray that you would work and that you would move in a mighty way within their lives. Father, many in here have said, I need need a close encounter with you. I need a close encounter with, with the God of the universe. I need that close encounter. But many also then said, I do realize the cost. And so, Father, I'm asking right now that you would give us the strength and the fortitude to give up, to cut off, to do whatever needs to be done to get close to you. If it means giving up relationships, fine, let's do it. Let's give those relationships up. If it means that we need to loosen our purse strings, fine, let's do it. Let's loosen our purse strings. If it means that we need to, that we need to, that we need to do something radical, Father, whatever it is, Lord, I just ask and pray that you give us the strength and the fortitude to do exactly what it is you require of us because we want to be closer to you. We want a new experience. We want to we, we want to trade that visitation for a habitation. We want to we, we want to trade the weekend visitation, Lord, with a with, with a with, with, with an experience where we go out and we have you living among us. But Lord, we realize that it comes at a great cost. And I ask and pray right now that Father, you would give us all that strength to lay whatever it is down, and cut it off. Do whatever needs to be done to get closer to you, no matter what people think, no matter what, no matter what the world thinks, no matter what the people that are sitting right next to us think. We are going hard after you. We are chasing you down until we catch you. And then once we catch you, we're still going to keep chasing you because it's not enough. Father, I thank you for this day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys for being here in a very weird and uh, unusual place. Uh, we'll keep everybody abreast as far as uh, the updates. Um, uh, I can't really have people going over and, and being in the sanctuary because uh, because of the, the, the circumstances that are there. That it's just a little too unsafe for people um, do it to do the air quality. But uh, we'll keep everybody abreast of what's going on. We'll let you know. Uh, my, my plan is right now that we're going to be meeting in here on Sunday mornings uh, until we get the problem over there fixed. Okay, so that's the plan right now. We'll be meeting this week. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> See, things have just been so weird and different. I, the pastor, and this happens all the time with pastors. Oh, uh, but if you have an offering, the only thing we require of our guests is that you fill that card out and, and drop it in there so we can contact you and, and stay in touch with you. Uh, but if you have any tithes and offerings, uh, the plate is over there right next to Brother Bob, and he'll be more than happy to help you out and point you in the right direction. Uh, make sure you do that. God bless you guys. We'll see you next time. Uh, we love you. We love you on Facebook. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.